Um, I'm going to uh, kick things off by inviting, uh, sorry, introducing uh, Richard Needham and Philip Stevens, um, who are no strangers to the Japan Society. Uh, but nevertheless, some of you may not uh, know that uh, Richard Needham um, is a businessman uh, turned politician, as he says in his new book, um, Richard Needham, One Man, Two Worlds, a memoir of a businessman in politics. Show um, it. Um, does he look like that? That's the question. <laughs> um, and rather suspiciously, it has endorsements um, by both Philip Stevens and Bill Emmett in the inside uh, back uh, covers. Um, so uh, I think you can say that this is a put up uh, job uh, here. Richard Needham um, was MP for Chippenham, Tory MP for Chippenham from 1979. Um, he served as a minister for Northern Ireland um, and uh, minister for trade, uh, and then went back into business uh, with GEC, with Dyson's, and for a very long time, still, I think, as a director of uh, NEC uh, Europe. Um, this book, one Man, Two Worlds, got a, a review in the Irish edition of the Sunday Times, which I can read out the first paragraph of, principally because Richard Needham sent it to me himself. Uh, this is by Malachi O'Doherty, and it starts, quote, I have been rebuking myself while reading this book for my past presumption that Sir Richard Needham was a pompous dimwit. He is, in fact, a writer and a raconteur of Woodhousian grace and panache. I'm tempted to have a vote at the end of this webinar as to which of those categories you think that uh, Richard falls into, but I won't do that. Uh, I will introduce my, our other uh, speaker today, Philip Stevens. Philip is chief political commentator at the Financial Times, where he's worked since 1983, uh, having previously uh, worked for uh, Reuters uh, in Brussels, a place where Philip and I, in fact, both um, uh, worked at the same time, um, me very much at the start of my journalistic career as well. Uh, Richard, uh, Philip also has a new book out, which for equality purposes, I will hold up uh, here. Britain Alone, um, The Path from Suez to Brexit, which was out uh, earlier this year. Peter Hennessy describes it on the front page as an instant classic. Um, in fact, um, and there isn't an endorsement on this book by Sir Richard Needham, and I'm one, we will we'll explore as to why uh, later on. But more seriously, this is a book about Britain's foreign policy since 1945, its stance in the world, um, and the path that led both to joining the European uh, community and then uh, leaving it in 2016 and finally uh, this year. But what particularly unites uh, Richard Needham, uh, Philip Stevens, uh, and the Japan Society is that Richard uh, founded with Yukio Sato um, and other collaborators the UK Japan 2000 group um, in uh, the 1980s, a group which is now um, has its form as the UK Japan 21st century group, and which I have certainly been a, a frequent participant in it, as has uh, Philip Stevens. Um, uh, in its uh, annual um, meetings, either in Britain or Japan. And so I'm going to kick off our conversation, which I'm going to lead for a while before opening to your questions, by asking about the UK and Japan. Um, and uh, Richard, uh, when you um, co-founded that group, and you confess in your book, you didn't know very much about Japan before then, you hadn't been to Japan, you, but you thought it was important for the UK to have better relations with it. Why was that? Um, and how have UK-Japan relations evolved since then in your perception? Well, I got, I was inter I got interested in Japan because, the, it, it, as I say in my book, the motivating um, force in my political career, my business career as well, has been how to better involve people at the workplace, which, which uh, is um, uh, explained by a man called Douglas McGregor as Theory X and Theory Y. Theory X basically says people work for money and need to be need to be um, forced into doing anything and not, are not uh, interested in anything other than their private lives. Uh, well, theory Y basically says people want more responsibility. Money isn't that important. In fact, not important as a motivator. And if treated properly, um, and, and and can can be capable of much greater productivity. And I was always. 
I always felt the British industry was crumbling and, 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 and facing disaster because of Theory X and because of the endless con uh, confrontation between the trade unions uh, and management, which was destroying uh, the industry of this country. And I had also studied people like Edwards Deming and, and Peter Drucker and others who picked up the, the way in which the Japanese worked together and created quality um, and, and, and did not have endless confrontation and strikes uh, was completely different from us. It was something we could learn from. And so that's why I got interested in Japan. Uh, and I've been to a thing called the Königswinter Conference, which was uh, started after the war by a very re resolute German lady who wanted to make sure we never went back to war uh, with Germany. And I thought we could replicate that with, with Japan. So I set off on my task. It was quite difficult actually to get it going, um, but it, it, it did allow, I did get it going in the end after about five years of effort. Um, and what was most important of all was that the Japanese were really interested in, in seeing it work. They wanted to get into Europe much more than they, than, they, than they were. And they thought the best way of doing this was to do it through the UK. As Nakasone, the prime minister said, an unsinkable aircraft carrier. That was also used in terms of Japan and China, by the way. So I, uh, so we got these all together, and that was the, the kickoff of it. I then discovered afterwards, of course, that Japan was not really Theory Y at all, or Theory X. It was like a sort of giant beehive where everybody had a role to play and everybody participated. But it was my introduction to Japan. And, and what, um, just to follow up on that, what did M M Margaret Thatcher think about Japan at the time? And um, Well, Mar Margaret Thatcher incredible. didn't think much about Japan because her constituents had quite a lot of people who were war veterans who weren't, weren't highly impressed by Japan. And it, she was even less impressed by Japan when I got involved with it. Um, uh, and Jim Pryor, I got Jim Pryor to be the chairman of it. But luckily what happened was that David Young and Cecil Parkinson got her to go to Japan. When she went there, she was absolutely fascinated by it because she could appreciate being a sort of chemist and an engineer. She was really impressed by Japanese, the, the neatness of Japan, the cleanliness of Japan, the way in which the whole thing was ordered and also beautifully presented and tasteful. So she thought when she compared a Japanese robot with a clunky English one, she said, we need to have some of these people here. And she also saw very quickly the opportunity that, that we could have of attracting uh, Japanese industry to set up in, in Britain as a base for their European operations, but also most importantly, as a way of changing British management towards Japanese ways of working. So she was supportive of it, but, but despite me rather than because of me. Now, Philip, um... Stephen, see, you will have attended, I would imagine, both Koenigswinter and the uh, UK uh, Japan 2000 group. And so you've seen both the sort of UK relationship with Germany um, evolve in that way and the UK Japan one. How would you compare and contrast them in terms of the, the British oh. attitude and, the, and the, the counterpart's view of us? Um, thank you. Um, I'll answer that. First, a footnote to, to Richard's remarks. I travelled with um, Margaret Thatcher in the as a journalist in the back of her play to, um, to, to Japan in 1989. I remember it well, because we um, had to stop off at Mo in Moscow on the way back to refuel. Um, but um, what she also liked, um, I'm sure, was the adulation. What struck me as a, as a journalist following her were the crowds that she attracted and the applause. And we went on, on what we then called the bullet train and. Yeah, everyone, the whole place was sort of buzzing. So she she really enjoyed, you know, the film star status that she, at least by 89, seemed to have uh, hanged. Um, the two groups, Koenigswinter, interestingly enough, became rather, I mean, Koenigswinter had been going for ages. And during the 1980s and 90s, it became rather dull. Um, it became quite difficult during the Thatcher Cole period. Um, here were two leaders who really didn't get on and then sort of dropped off a bit. And it, you know, I think the, it got rather sort of submerged in the EU. It's become, I think, much more interesting in recent years around Brexit because we've both sides have realised again that they have to talk to each other. Um, 
and we have to talk to each other now outside the context of the EU. For me, um, I mean, the Japan uh, group was absolutely fascinating, partly because, you know, until the early noughties, I'd got very little experience of, uh, of East Asia at all. And this was, a, for me, an entry into it. And what I felt about Japan then, um, apart from all the, all the things that, that Rich had said about, you know, admiration for the ordered society and the, uh, uh, was that back, you know, in my first visits, it was, it was really a, a nation then that had sort of slightly lost its way. I mean, after, you know, after the sort of financial problems of the 90s and growth had stopped, and it seemed to be changing prime ministers sort of every year or having had a long period of stability. You know, every time I went to Japan, it seemed to be that there was an, and I'm probably exaggerating, but it seemed that there was another prime minister. Um, and it had lost its sort of self-confidence. Um, but it was, for, so for me, it was more an education. But again, I think, you know, um, I think after, you know, again, the sort of res restoration of some sort of political stability uh, with Abe San and um, a sort of balance and equilibrium now in the economy, um, I think Japan has recovered that sort of confidence wasn't there when I initially started going. And, you know, now we are in some ways, you know, more like each other, Britain and Japan, than uh, we've been for a long time, both in our ways sort of slightly semi-detached from the blocks around us. Yes, could you imagine a counterpart, perhaps from Nikkei or some, uh, since your, your, your sister companies, um, Nikkei and the FD, writing a book, Japan Alone? Um, um, well, I think they certainly, I think they've, it's less so now, but certainly, you know, I remember sort of, you know, 10 years ago being in Japan when everyone else was being nice to China. You know, the Americans and the Europeans were all saying, oh, they're going to turn out to be responsible stakeholders. And, you know, after China's economic development will come, you know, the sort of slowly, but it'll come acceptance to the rules-based system. And our Japanese counterparts were, I think, understandably a little sceptical about this. Uh, I think now that um, you could say, well, you know, you could say that Europeans and um, uh, Americans are more realistic uh, about China's ambitions. Um, there's, a, there's more a meeting of minds, as it were. Richard, do you, do you see that, see Britain and Japan now as being in a sort of somewhat uh, similar position um, and with that, that meeting of minds about about Asia, about China? Um, Somewhat. I mean, it's pretty, it's still pretty tenuous. I mean, I, I, can't, I haven't got the figures here, but what percentage Japan has of UK trade is pretty tiny. And what percentage of our exports to, to Japan and in Japanese economic terms is pretty tiny. So I think for the vast majority of people, it, you, you know, the, 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 the Britain does not come too often onto their television screens, if at all. Uh, there are similarities. I wouldn't go, I mean, when once saying at a 21st century group or 2000 group to, to one of the Japanese prime ministers, how, when are you going to have a, a, a common economic currency in, with, with, with Korea and with, with China? And he looked at me and said, I'm completely mad and said, never. <laughs> and you and you you can't imagine in that happening, um, but there is there are things that the elites in Japan and Britain have monarchy and uh, and and much more contact than they used to have. We don't get anything like the number of students that we ought to get from Japan to the UK or vice versa. Although we have the jet program and so on, so we have to keep working at that relationship. Uh, with us being both of us outside the, the massive trade blocks confronting us, we ought to have more in common. But what's interesting to me with an NEC hat on is how difficult it is to get the Japanese um, industry and defence involved with ours. You know, that's going to be one of the criteria that, 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 that underpins Japanese-UK relationships. So uh, I wouldn't push it too far, but 
I, I accept that, that both of us uh, have similarities into how we're going to face our futures. I think just to add to that, we, I mean, we both, that, that, that's just the wrong word, but I suppose, we both share now a common dependency on the United States, I think. Yeah. Japan obviously has, you know, the security treaty with the US. Now that we are out of Europe, um, we've demolished, if you like, the European pillar of our foreign policy. Uh, we're left with what we still call the special relationship. So there is that, you know, there is that parallel in the sense that we both look first to Washington now in, in terms of foreign policy. I don't know that the Japanese think of Russia as a threat in quite the same way that we do, and they've been negotiating forever, however many years, for those islands north of Japan to get them back. So I don't, I mean, I think their enemies, um, like China, well, and I think China is a potential enemy of Japan, uh, are, are much more formidable than, than, I mean, at least Europe is, meant, is, is, is still, are still allies and members of NATO. But I think Russia uh, is much more important to us than it is to the yeah. Japanese. The Japanese have never forgotten that their armies in Manchuria were completely destroyed by the Russians in 1945. Yeah. And do you, if, if you were trade minister now, um, Richard, would you be going out there on the, um, on the uh, HMS Queen Elizabeth, on the, on the aircraft carrier and um, seeking to... Uh, to um, use that to uh, to promote Britain, or um, uh, by the way, a carrier strike force with a Dutch warship alongside, but U.S. planes on it. So, some a very multinational group. Would you see defence and, as it were, our defence posture as part of your uh, selling opportunity as trade minister, or would you do it another way, perhaps on the future new Royal Yacht? Not. I wouldn't go on the Royal Yacht. I mean, if the Royal Yacht was still still going and I never had understood I mean when I was trade minister we took the decision to scrap her because it was going to cost I don't know 100 million pounds or well, it wasn't actually it was going to cost 30 million pounds to bring her up to scratch well I think that's I don't think that was really a true figure at all for bringing her up to scratch but now she's parked in Glasgow um, or Edinburgh rather uh, I'd leave her there I think the idea of spending 200 million on a new one is is I, I mean I just think it's a gesture I don't think it's, it's, it's sensible. I mean, what the trade policy now, and I'd be much better than the present incumbent, by the way, the trade policy now has got to be to build trade relationships with, with, with new partners as well as with Europe. You can't give up on Europe, for goodness sake. It's 45, 50% of our trade. So you've got to keep, and, and you've got to, as well as that, you've now got to look for the East Asian trade group. You've got to look at, um, you've got to look at other trade arrangements. But going back to Japan, I mean, the trade agreement we've just got with Japan is going to increase our trade by, what is it, 0.03% or something? I mean, it's, it's marginal. I mean, the biggest thing we have to do as a trade minister now is to, is to make sure we keep the Japanese investments that we've got here and don't lose them and, and build on them. And as, as a trade minister, I think, We'd have to con you'd have to concentrate much more on services, joint ventures, uh, the soft side, if you like, provided by tourism and so on, because really we don't have much of an industry left. How would you think about selling uh, Britain, um, Philip? I mean, uh, we are where we are, as they say. What would you be? What would you be put to, putting as your kind of um, Britain promotion manifesto? in the absence of, of a real global Britain definition from the government? Well, I think it's hard. I think the first thing, you know, whatever, wherever one stood in the argument about Brexit, um, I think the first thing I'd do if I was trying to sell Britain was to demonstrate to the rest of the world that we had, although we were outside the EU, we had a good and strong and comfortable relationship with the rest of Europe. Because even though we're outside uh, of the European Union. A lot of countries will look at us and want to be, you know, linked, tied to us and perhaps based here because of English and because of, you know, uh, all the other attractions we have as a creative culture, whatever. Um, but they want to know that we get on with our neighbours. And if they're doing business in the UK, maybe they could be doing business with ease in Germany and France and 
elsewhere and they we even though we're outside so i think the thing i think the most urgent thing for us to improve our relationships although it may seem to be saying to to improve our relationships with countries like japan or malaysia or anywhere else is to sort out some of these problems that are you know pulling on our relationships northern ireland is 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 the obvious one but there are one or two others and say you know we now have a good strong grown up economic and political relationship with the rest of europe we're apart but we're good friends and you know if you come and do business with us we are still a platform for the european continent and one thing i would do additionally to that as a long term aim is to massively increase the amount of foreign language abilities of british business pen which are currently pretty well zero if you want to trade with foreign countries um which are not uh, primarily english speaking then you have to learn the languages of those companies if you can't learn the languages fluently at least you can learn enough to get by and to understand the culture that comes from that but that's one of the great adv- disadvantages we have in comparison to the germans who for example are much better at learning english and, and other languages than we are we've never we've never had a proper strategy or plan for that let me just uh, dwell a little bit on um, on being a businessman in politics perhaps to uh, and what it's like to to come from business into politics uh, I'm tempted to point out that America just had a businessman in the White House um and I know that he won't write um a memoir quite the same as yours I hope not uh, um but um what just just look he couldn't at, write a memoir anyway could he he couldn't read it either to be honest no. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway what what is it about businessmen and politics i mean one uh, what is it that makes it make, makes it work for some but actually not for many um very very few because they're completely different i mean you only have to i mean for a start politicians don't employ the people in the civil service who work for them so your relationship with the people who are meant to be undertaking what you want of them is entirely different from if you're the boss secondly businessmen do not have to worry about how they look or whether they can speak properly in public because the relationship that they have with their employees is can, can be done face to face they don't have to be reasonably uh, good looking if, uh, if in fact m- most businessmen couldn't care less about those sorts of things and the whole and, and the other thing about a businessman is you can plan what you're trying to do with your colleagues in a very structured way you can commit resources to what you're aiming to achieve um and there is usually an element of confidentiality which can be maintained within an organization which is in business and a continuity that does not exist in government if you're a politician it's other than setting broad um outline policies um the, the difficulty of implementing them is much much greater and the skills that you require as a politician are entirely different from the skills you require as a businessman and that's why so very few businessmen are successful in politics because the, the the differences are fundamental absolutely fundamental once you've understood that then of course it is possible for to be able to try to discipline yourself in in ways which make you capable of both but very often everybody says oh we should have more businessmen in politics god forbid what what do you I, think about it yeah i draw a contrast between um business folk who like yourself richard become mp's and if you like do their political apprenticeship in the house of commons before coming becoming ministers i think you know and you 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 yourself are living proof that um uh business people can be successful politicians i contrast that group with those and i'm thinking of like david young or archie norman people who are sort of parachuted in from the sort of executive offices um of business into big positions in government and in my experience they invariably flounder for the reasons that richard expressed they have learned over many over decades that they can they to do things in a certain way and they can't adjust to the realities of politics the realities of decision making in in whitehall but i think you know i think personally the house of commons 
would be much better off if there were more business people um, going in, as long as they are not the sort of business people that we sometimes see who say, you know, having made my millions, I know, now know how to run the economy, <laughs> and, you know, how to set interest. But that's the problem, isn't it, Philip? There is a few the of those. There's a few of those. But I think they're worth having to, to get the other experience. Well, I didn't do that well. You're very flattered me, but I didn't do that well. <laughs> Parliamentary Under Secretary for seven years and Minister of Trade for three. I mean, you know, I got I got I got the insight of the summit. I didn't get anywhere near it. There are lots of people <laughs> on the back benches for the whole of you know for the 30 years. So um. how is would you enter politics today, Richard? I mean, um if you if you were uh, as it were the corresponding position to the one you were in in the 1970s? It's very difficult, isn't it? I mean, my trouble is I couldn't keep my mouth shut. And, I, and that's, that's very difficult to change because um, I believe actually that, that, that to be a successful politician or minister for that, that you, you should be open and frank with people. And I hate secrecy in politics. I hate secrecy anywhere. I think by and large secrecy is, is, a, is a way of covering cock up. So to go into it now, you, you really have to remember that whatever you say is going to be listened to, whatever you do is going to, like, could possibly find itself in the way of the paper. So the self-discipline that is required to be a politician now is immeasurably different from it was in my time. I still think it's a fantastic career to have from your mid-30s to your mid-50s. You, you don't want to spend your life at it. But if you can do it for 20 years or so, you meet all sorts of fascinating people. You go to fascinating places. And if you have the right job, you can actually, as I was lucky enough to, in Belfast, for example, to, and, and in trade for that matter, to do something worthwhile. But you've got to go in and be really careful how you handle it. I mean, the, the, your fellow Etonian who's in number 10 Downing Street uh, wasn't entirely... Um, uh, um, he's not entirely careful in choosing his words, I would say, but... Um, well, that, that isn't finished yet, is it? I mean, no, we haven't come to the end of that yet. No, we haven't seen the end of the story. That's right. Philip, just an observation on... Uh, has pol is politics just a, a swings and roundabouts thing that goes through different cycles, in your view, in the UK, or, or has something fundamentally changed? Um, I, think, um, I think the world has fundamentally changed. And, you know, I was I would count myself among those who were sort of, if you like, misled by the relative calm and tranquility, the second half of the 20th century into thinking you know, we left behind us the the great power competition and upheavals um, of the first half of the 20th century into the 19th century. So I think there was a certain, you know, the end of history theory brought a certain and we've not since now had a great, these great upheavals. America has completely been completely reassessing its place in the world, its leadership of the world. And Trump was part of that phenomenon, as it were. Um, I think in the case of Britain, um, we've gone through something resembling a sort of nervous breakdown in terms of working out where we fit in the world and deciding we don't fit in Europe anymore, but not quite knowing where else that we're going to um, uh, fit. I think, you know, having been around for a long time, I'm conscious, you know, one always thinks that, you know, the last generation or the generation before were stronger, you know, more solid people. But I must say, you know, if one, I look back at the cabinets and shadow cabinets of the 1980s and 1990s and indeed the early 2000s the sort of figures you know margaret thatcher's cabinet you know was full of big politicians the labor party front benches were full of big politicians and you know the successive governments were you know i i don't i think we are that we are in a bit of a curious period now with when you look across the the front benches of the house of commons and this isn't a at all a party political point you don't see a you know a clutch of sort of of you know a decent sized clutch of big political beasts as it were who are going to change the argument in our politics i hope that that's just you know that's just a sort of generational shift and that you know 
few years down the line, and you can see some of them now, a lot of these younger politicians will have emerged. But I think that, you know, in Britain now, we're destined to be in this sort of no man's land for probably, you know, at least five years and maybe longer, sort of not knowing quite where we are relative with respect to the rest of the world and not having the obvious political leaders who are ready to stand up and say, right, here, here's the new pathway. This is what global Britain means, or this is what, you know, this is where Britain has got to fit in this new world. I, you know, you may see them, uh, Bill, or you may, Richard, but I, I can't see them in any of the, any of the parties, frankly. And of course, the danger is that if, without those sort of figures, you know, the danger is of fragmentation of, you know, Scotland looking to, you know, to, to leave the union and deed of Northern Ireland being pushed to one side, as it were. Now we're at the halfway point um, in our time, so I'm going to invite um, and indeed welcome anyone who wishes to ask a question to either raise their hands or, uh, or put um, a question into chat. So there are a number of, uh, of comments in chat, which are very interesting. Um, and one of them is by Paul Farrelly about um, the, the comparison between the Japan group in parliament and the German group. Um, and I'm wondering if Paul would like to um, make that comment to the group or, um, and turn his video on, but, and also if you, if you would like to ask any question of Richard and Philip, both of whom you all know well. Paul, are you? Thank, thanks, Bill. I, um, uh, I advise business, but uh, I, um, unlike Richard, I was not a businessman, but I was a business editor um, when I entered Parliament and uh, it was four years after Richard uh, retired but in 1997 Richard I was doing my dry run in Chesham and Amersham of, of all places. Um, so thanks for the, 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 the fabulous talk. Uh, in my comment on, on, on the chat I, I really just wanted to draw attention having heard the comparisons um, with Koenigswinter to the fact that um, that the, the Japanese embassy um, in London, and I can't speak whether this is replicated around the world, truly works so hard and is instrumental in supporting all sorts of initiatives and societies. When having looked around the diplomatic scene in, in, in London, other countries, um, uh, and I've got a long involvement in Germany, and it's not uh, meant as a, as a criticism. Uh, the French, for example, take take their importance for granted, and I think it's really admirable. And it's one of the things that we need to do, I think, in in Britain, uh, certainly after Brexit, is is replicate uh, those sorts of efforts. And now is certainly not the time, quite apart from the arguments over the the aid budget for our foreign office to, to cut its funding for embassies, as is happening, for instance, in Berlin. Oh, I, I, I am an enormous uh, fan, actually, of the foreign office. I think the fact that you, could, as, a, as a diplomat, is a, is a wonderful training, because it, it, you, you have to have the language of the place you're in, you have to have the, the, the diplomatic skills of being a salesman, of being charming, of being presentable, um, and I think the Foreign Office is a, still remains a superb organisation. When I first came into Parliament, it did not have anything like a sufficient business orientation as I felt it should have. But I think over the years uh, that has changed. And I think now they set themselves proper key, key objectives. They have proper plans uh, of how to develop. Um, their roles in, in the local economies where they are diplomats. And I think it's a lot, lot better than it was. But I agree with you entirely. Two things. Firstly, I think it should, it should, um, it should not be. Obviously, I, I think the, the fund should be maintained. And secondly, I think that if, if, if there's ever a reason for having transfer of skills between business and government, it's, it, it's in the area of, of overseas representation. Um, and I'm, uh, and I think we're pretty good at that. 
uh, it's one of the areas where I felt as Minister of Trade we had something which was which which I could be really proud of. By the way, just one interesting point. When I first came involved with Japan, I used to go to the Japanese embassy with Yukio Sato, and the Japanese ambassador didn't speak any English, or very little. He was a French speaker. That's how important they thought it was in 1980. Certainly wouldn't happen now. Absolutely. No. <laughs> um, I'm going to ask, um, Simon Shelton put in a, um, a, a comment about uh, defence defense relationships and defense business with, with Japan. And I'm wondering if you, Simon, would like to make that and raise, a, raise, that, raise, your, raise it as a question, both for Richard and for Philip about our strategic relations. Yes, indeed. Oh, thank you, Bill. Um, I, I was picking up on uh, Richard's comments, speaking from NEC and saying that uh, we can't get the Japanese to do defense business with the UK, but everybody, everybody knows, or those who know me know that I have been following programs like this for some time. There are two particular programs in relatively recent years where the UK government has, if you like, lifted its skirts slightly to the Japanese and suggested in the case of maritime patrol aircraft, and more recently the fleet solid support program that we might welcome Japanese uh, participation. And then an awful lot of politicking goes on behind the scenes and the local uh, domestic industry does quite a good job of making it very difficult for the Japanese to do, who don't really understand why these opportunities don't go forward. And I suppose my question, predominantly for, for Richard, but probably goes to both of you, is the inconsistency that we sometimes show from our government is clearly not understood um, by the Japanese who are not experienced in this area? And should we not perhaps encourage our political masters to be a bit more strategic in looking at Japan as a potential defence equipment partner? Yes, we should. I agree with you entirely. But uh, I don't know, Simon, the extent to which um, that comes from the Japanese side or our side. I suspect that the British Ministry of Defence is keener to work with the Japanese than the other way around. And the reasons for that I'm not clear of, because you would think that, that, that when you look at these great programmes, that the more people you can get involved, the easier it is to share the cost. But it seems to me to have taken a huge amount of time to see any real positive outcomes of defence collaboration between the two countries, whether sending the aircraft carrier there with a Dutch destroyer in um, support because we can't have, haven't got enough destroyers of our own, and secondly with American aeroplanes because we can't afford the ones ourselves. I don't know whether that will impress them. Um, but I do think it's something we should, it is a key, should be a key element of Anglo-Japanese uh, cooperation. And is there, Philip, is there an issue in, I mean, in the British politics of defence? We know that in, in, in Japan there is an issue of their dependency on the United States and the, this dilemma about about um, wanting to buy other, other, other from other sources, but then in the end thinking, well, perhaps we better go to, to mother, you know, father America or what, or brother America. Is there a, an equivalent at the British end of, of in, in our reticence about being strategic on, on defense industry and defense collaboration that's to do with our dependence on the US? I think there is. I mean, we've been for the last 10 or 15 years, um, slightly torn between our dependence on the US and, you know, if you look at, you know, BAE systems and its involvement in huge projects like the F-35, then, you know, that is going, that's going to be around for a long time. But we've been trying to, to develop, particularly with the French, areas, I think, like sonar and torpedoes and a little bit of missile. And also we have an important nuclear collaboration agreement with the French now, but we're half-hearted, we've been half-hearted in Europe in terms of collaboration. And now we've, we've stood aside from the Anglo-German project for the fifth generation fighter um, or you know, fighter plane, or whether it's going to be a drone or a manned aircraft, it's not quite clear, and said that we're going to build our own, the, the Tempest, which um, I, I think um, was not going to be built. I mean, it's just ludicrous the idea that that we on our own could could build this and unfortunately because of brexit we've taken ourselves out of the european defense 
fund, as it were, newly established, which will enhance co collaboration. Now, at some point, I think, you know, the pressures of, of dependency on the US will push us back towards Europe. The question for me would be is, are there particular technologies and probably sort of niche, niche technologies that we could work with Japan on? I don't think, you know, there is an, an obvious opening for big projects, you know, where, you know, plat, you know, weapons platforms or ships or, or aeroplanes. But there are lots of, you know, defense and my, has myriad dimensions. And are there opportunities um, in digital equipment, in cyber elsewhere? And I think that's where, you know, if I was working in the, in the trade department, the defense ministry, I'd be looking for areas of potential collaboration. But we should certainly throw open the doors. And, you know, we need to be saying to countries like Japan, look, you know, the rules have changed for us in terms of trade and uh, our relationships. You know, what can we do together? And, um, you know, as, as sort of basically as that. Yes, I mean, that. I just want to, Philip's absolutely right about that. Um, but one of the one of the issues is that, I mean, talking again with a sort of NEC hat on, the NEC has gone from a huge investor in Britain. I mean, it had a, a one to two billion chip plant in Livingston in Scotland, it's gone. Their big factory in Telford, gone. Numbers of people employed have gone from thousands to hundreds. And it's a question of the lack of self-confidence that Japan had when confronted with the new competition from China and also from Europe when you talk about mobile phones. There's a real opportunity now that's come back with, with, with Huawei being, being cast into outer darkness. The Japanese now, um, and, and I think they're going to take it, which is really exciting. And 5G, for example, looking at the technology, there's a real opportunity for Japanese companies to come back now um, and, and reposition themselves in the market. There's a gap there, both in the UK and across Europe, which they can fill. And I'm excited by that as an opportunity. Thank you. Next, um, I've got Martin Barrow has got his hand up. Let me ask Martin to... Come on. Thank you, Bill, and uh, thank both of you for all your insights on many different aspects. I would like to hear a bit more about people-to-people -people engagement, which is important for business, not just people. Um, and uh, um, Rich, Richard touched on education, and um, uh, Philip touched on the, the Global Britain messaging but we need, in terms of building tourism and education in both directions, we need to be actively planning, working together for the post-COVID relaunch. And I've often said here across government, saying Global Britain doesn't work when it's translated into Japanese or any other language. It's got no clearly meet. We've got to get the message out that the UK is open and welcoming the students tourists and investors. Now, what more can we do to work together on that? Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Can I just jump in on one thing there, Bill? Yes. The, the thing is, you know, we've really got to change our language on immigration. I mean, the way I put it, if you listen to ministers, it often sounds that they're, they're standing up one day and saying we're open for business. And then the next day they're standing up saying, but we're close to foreigners. And, you know, we have to, as a country and, the, you know, the, the government, um, understand that if we're going to be global and we're going to embrace globalization and free trade, we cannot be setting up new barriers to people from all over the world coming here. And if you stand outside Britain and look in, and I hear this from lots of people from different countries. It sounds very much to them that we're pulling up the gangplank in terms of personnel and, and visas and all these other things. And, you know, Home Secretary is constantly banging on about, you know, too many foreigners and things. This is not this is not the messaging that we need. We need to be talking about collaboration with businesses in Japan and elsewhere, and that collaboration, including, you know, employees and, you know, entrepreneurs and whatever coming here 
with ease of access and not having to earn a million pounds or deposit a million pounds before they can do it. Sorry, I feel quite strongly about this. Oh, you're so right, Philip. You're so right. I mean, Heidi and I were talking before we started this webinar, and she was telling me about the case of some young Japanese student who'd been here for two years and then was kicked out and had rung her up. Uh, a couple of days ago to talk to her about being a reference for her to go and work in the Canadian embassy in Tokyo. I mean, that's just anecdote. But it, I mean, we've been talking about Im immigration and, and the British approach to it in the 2000 group and the 21st century group for as many of the 30 years as I, you know, I've been involved in, I can remember. And you're absolutely right. It's ridiculous. Um, and it's just, it's bad politics. It's bad sense. It's bad everything. And it doesn't actually make that much difference in terms of what the views of the punters are. I wonder, uh, Stephen Gomesall had a, a point about our relationship with Europe. I wonder if you'd like to come on screen, Stephen. Thank you very much, uh, Bill. Um, yeah, I mean, the question was asked, um, how uh, does Britain continue to attract Japanese investment, which is absolutely crucial to our economy? Uh, and I'd just like to comment a little bit on that. Um, like Richard, uh, I've represented for a long while um, a Japanese company, uh, Hitachi, which has had a long historic investment in the UK in lots of different areas. And um, I, I think it's fair to say that although uh, there was terrible shock and horror at the result of the referendum, uh, Hitachi anyway has not given up on the UK, far from it. But I think um, future investment will depend on a number of things, primarily how we structure our future relationship with Europe, because as was said earlier, um, Japanese companies still like to be able to access Europe from the UK. And if that's not possible, that will be a big disincentive to investment. Uh, and secondly, and perhaps most importantly, that most, you know, the, the important thing is what is you know, the British economy looking like? What is our macroeconomic growth looking like? What are the opportunities for doing new, new um, investment in the UK? And I think, you know, whether we like Brexit or not, everybody and the government particularly has just got one question that needs to be addressed, which is how you make a success of the UK outside the EU. And I don't, you know, I think the government came to power without uh, very clear ideas on how to do that. And uh, when you look at the UK's economy from the outside at the moment, uh, there are a number of slogans which the government lives off, as it were, um, primarily Global Britain, um, levelling up, and uh, our climate change targets, which are ambitious. But when you drill down into policy, the government doesn't have in place really the detailed policies to make any of those three ambitions uh, implementable at this stage. And it seems to me that the challenge is, you know, for the government or for any political party which wants to replace the government is to come up with answers to how you address um, our foreign posture, uh, our climate obligations uh, and um, leveling up, in other words, all the issues of social cohesion. But look, looked at from just a Japanese business perspective, I think the most important thing is still uh, the state of our relationship with Europe and the openness of our economy. And there it's a question of, you know, what are our trading relationships with other countries, uh, whether talent is accessible within the UK, and what is the state of the UK infrastructure, not only physical infrastructure, but digital infrastructure. And coming back to Richard's point, I think he's absolutely right that uh, there is still a lot of opportunity for uh, 
collaboration between Japanese business and British business in a lot of new technologies. Uh, for example, uh, electrification, electric vehicles, where well, we've seen some investments coming in uh, recently, and the whole area of uh, digital uh, systems for control of social infrastructure and for government itself. So I think, you know, there are still the opportunities, but people are looking to see whether uh, the government has policies in place to incentivize the private sector to address these opportunities. Thank you, Stephen. Do you think, Philip, that um, the pandemic has basically crowded that out? And will that emerge? I mean, there's a logic to every, all of that um, coming through, whether one agrees with the particular policies or not. The current, what is currently notable is there is the absence of any clarity um, or absence of, of much necessary clarity. Yeah, and I think there's also, I mean, in the of trade as well, there's also this sort of, it's almost a sort of scorecard, how many trade deals can we do? As if the simple fact of doing a trade deal transforms, you know, the position. So I think, you know, we're now in a, I mean, across the government, I think Stephen put the point really well. Across the government, we've got lots of ambitions and objectives and very precious little sign of people doing the sort of hard grinding work that translates these into uh, action and into results. Um, you know, I, I mean, I'm afraid I despair rather of, of the present trade department and, and business setup because I just don't get the sense that here are people who are going to get a grip on and focus on a, a num, you know, a small, it's going to be a relatively small number of priority areas and countries. And I don't get that sense at all. I get the sense of how many trade deals can we do? Of course, free ports is one of their great flagship policies. And the introduction of free ports around the country is meant to produce a massive increase in inward investment because of the advantages of moving to these sites. The question is how much that will just replace um, existing business within 50 miles of a free port moving into the free port to reduce its taxes. But that's one of their major objectives that they, the government is placing a lot, of, um, a lot of hope on. I think the jury's out. I, 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 I fail to see that it's going to be a massive game changer, but they certainly have it as one of their major objectives. I'll, um, the evidence elsewhere is that it doesn't really, free ports don't really change much. Yeah, I agree. This is a, you know, this is a headline grabber rather than a sort of, you know, a serious. No, no other sort of grabber, Philip. <laughs> That's, uh, I think, uh, just to make sure that it's a bipartisan um, uh, lamentation, I'll read out Paul Farrelly's point on the current, uh, put, he put in chat, uh, on the current point about the UK's message to the world, I despair as much now as a former Labour MP of the Labour Party's by British search for a policy initiative as he did when Gordon Brown resorted to it a decade ago. And I must say, when you... It see reminds me very much of the We're Backing Britain campaign of 1968, which I refer to in my book after yes. valuation. Although that one actually was started by a business person, but it is, you know... Periodically, we get these sort of, you know, supposedly patriotic, um, and I think idiotic is better, is a more appropriate adjective than, than patriotic. <laughs> and when I was Minister of Trade, I've spent my life fighting by Britain last. Do you remember in Malaysia? <laughs> Talking of Malaysia, let me ask, uh, perhaps almost our final question. Um, Neil Riley has got a question about <laughs> Asia and therefore and about the Trans-Pacific Partnership, but about what, what this can do for, for Britain, which leads us into a conversation about Asia. Neil. Hi there. Well, thank you. I just thought I'd ask really, because a lot of the discussion, really interesting discussion has been about Britain, the role after Brexit and our role in the world. And um, I don't know... Well, can the TPP begin to kind of fill a gap, either in a, an economic sense, but also in kind of giving a marker about global free trade and Britain's position to promote that? I just wondered if you had any thoughts. Is it worth being at that table? 
Philip or Richard? Probably. I think it's probably, if it depends on, you know, it depends on what the cost of being at the table is. And um, uh, um, I don't suppose the farmers will like it because the cost of every trade deal, I mean, if you think of it in term, in domestic political terms, is going to be um, in terms of uh, farm produce, agricultural produce. But I, so I think there's no harm. But as I say, it's not, you know, you can't measure success. You know, obviously, one has to build frameworks for successful trade and investment transfers, but they're not the measure of success. The measure of success is whether you, one, make your own your domestic economy and marketplace sufficiently attractive to bring people here, and two, whether you have business with the help of government focusing on some key areas and markets and opportunities and I think you know in my case I would say that you know the government which has made a point in its security strategy as well as its business strategy talking about technology should be this is one of the areas with Japan um you know Richard was talking about it coming back you know the opportunity for Japan with 5G well Britain should be talking to Japan about that particular area and I think that sort of work is much more valuable than being at every trade negotiating table. Just one final point. Um, we can do it. I mean, I, I worked with James Dyson, as some of you know, for 16 years. And Dyson, we, we got a fellow at the Japanese embassy to, to a British embassy in Japan to um, be our boss in Japan. And Dyson went from nothing, but because it, it built the right size of machine with the right technology, Dyson is now, even though they're made in Malaysia, the profits still come here. Japan, Dyson is now the largest manufacturer of vacuum cleaners in Japan. It has a huge share of the market. So it can be done. There's no reason you don't, you know, trade deals are fine, but actually it can be done anyway. If you've got the right approach to the market, you understand it, how it works, how you're going to get in there, how you're going to invest sufficient, how you're going to market it, blah, blah, blah. It can be done. And Dyson is a wonderful example of that. And do you think, I mean, just as a, a final point, I mean, you've, you have mentioned Malaysia and you know also Indonesia, I think, pretty well. Um, uh, the, those parts of, of Asia are getting more co connected to China, more uh, some ways dependent on China than they were perhaps in the 1990s and 80s when you were selling there. Has that changed the, the dialogue that you'd have to have as a British trade minister or as a British business person? Or You're going to have to concentrate much, much more on specific areas, specific services, specific things which interest them. Um, the most important thing there is to welcome their students, get them over here, get them investing over here, buying homes here. Um, that, that's the way you, you, you'll, you'll, you'll succeed in that. We've done very well with that in Malaysia. We haven't done it with Indonesia, even though I spent a lot of time and effort there because of my family connections. We've never really cracked the, the Indonesian relationship, but it's a huge uh, market of the future. But the key thing to do is to get them here. I think it's, it's that way around and get their kids here. Philip, any last words? No, I think that's I think that's that's it. And I think, as I say, you know, what we need in the next few years is a a, a little less political posturing, um, a bit more pragmatism, particularly about our relationship with Europe and trying to get it on an even keel, even if we're separate, and some focus on particular, you know, global. I begin my book with a um, with a quote from a chap called Henry Tizard, who was the chief scientist um, in Whitehall during the 1940s, and he'd worked for Churchill during the war. And he got worried about our, the grandiosity of some of our ambitions post-war, even as the empire was um, beginning to um, disintegrate. And he, he made the remark that, you know, look, we're a great nation, but we're no longer a great power. And if we keep pretending to be a great power, the danger is we'll cease to be a great nation. And I think that advice 
is as relevant now, perhaps more so than it was then. Hi, Philip's book. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. Very good. Well, let me thank um, uh, Philip Stevens and Richard Needham uh, very warmly for uh, sparing this hour for us and for having written these books. As a fellow author, I absolutely feel that I need to hold up books to and, and urge everyone to buy them. Um, but uh, also, I congratulate you both on, on completing them, which is no, no easy task. So uh, thank you very much for your thoughts, for your insights, for your good humor, and for your support for UK-Japan relations and understanding. And thank you to everyone for joining uh, this conversation. Um, and uh, do come to uh, our next webinars as well. But thank you again. Thank you for setting it up. Thank um, you very much. Thank, thank you. you. To the society in Heidi. Yeah, yeah.